How to improve on classical guitar. That's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to start right now. Uh, we've got topics including bar chords, uh, reacting to a leap bata, why are Segovia scales different, ascending and descending, and many more questions that have been sent in advance. I'd love to see your questions in the chat. And uh, as we're getting started, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to play just a little snippet of Asturias, uh, the way you would normally play it in a minor key, and it sounds like this. And then I'm going to play a snippet in a major key, and I'd love for you to let me know in the chat, uh, do you like it in the major key? Is that an interesting variation? Or would you rather just keep it strictly in the original minor? So here is just a little snippet of Asturias in the major key. So let me know what you think uh, in the chat. And so as we're getting started here, um, I will go ahead and um, talk about a bar chord question that I got from Kaleidoscope. Uh, he said, a topic you've covered before is bar chords and partial bar chords. No, how no matter how much I practice my bar chords, they still aren't up to scratch. Can you advise on anything which will improve my technique? Yeah, bar chords are tough. You know, I remember years ago I had this student uh, who was in law school, and so he wasn't looking to become a professional musician. He was looking to become a lawyer, and he just wanted to play music for fun. Uh, but he found that uh, he was very frustrated with bar chords, and he and I worked with bar chords, and it was just kind of his nemesis. Eventually, we got to the point uh, where he could play bar chords, but it took a period of months. So I get it. Bar chords can be frustrating, and I remember in the early days when I was learning guitar, uh, it's a tough thing to learn bar chords. So I think a few things may help, uh, Colin, with your question. Uh, one is uh, to do a partial bar instead of a full bar. Uh, so... Uh, instead of you know starting off with just a full bar like this, uh, then uh, you know you might want to just start with something like this. So for for the F chord, instead of barring all the strings, you just bar some of the strings. Um, that may be something that will help with the bar chords. Um, another thing is being strategic on the pressure. Uh, so, in other words, when you're playing something like this E shape slid up to make an F chord, you don't really need to press with the index finger on the 5th, 4th, and 3rd strings. You really just need to press on the 6th, uh, 2nd, and 1st. So, if I were to take these other fingers off, you know, those strings can be muted. I just need the 6th, 2nd, and 1st strings to come out clearly. So, being strategic with the pressure can help. Making sure you're close to the fret. You know, if you're further back in the fret, it's going to be harder uh, to get good pressure there. And, um, um, and then also uh, making sure maybe your bar finger's a little bit on its side because there's bone in the side of the finger. And so if you, uh, you know, angle it on its side a little bit, you'll get the bone helping to press down instead of just the flat part of the finger. Also, you may need to adjust how much of the bar is across the fretboard because of where the grooves are from uh, where your finger bends. So, you know, adjusting your finger back and forth may really help uh, with the effectiveness of the bar chord so you don't have a finger that's kind of in the groove of, of the curve of your finger. But it definitely is one of the harder techniques. So yeah, I would start with the partial bars. I would be strategic with my pressure. I'd be close to the fret. I'd be on the side of the finger. Um, adjust back and forth this way. All those things will help with the bars. If you have other questions about bar chords, uh, let me know in the chat. I see Voyage uh, and Gene Madsen say hello in the chat. I see Voyage says, Asturias strictly in minor, though it sounds good in major. Yeah, I just thought it was kind of fun to play around with. Uh, I've been playing around with it in major lately and uh, just find it's kind of a nice contrast. But obviously, Asturias is supposed to be in minor. That is the classic way to do it. So, you know, here it is again in minor, uh, the way it's supposed to be. Such a beautiful and iconic piece, Asturias by Albanius. Um, so another um, question I received, and this was actually over on Instagram. Uh, someone was commenting on my Instagram reels, uh, which are similar to what I post on YouTube shorts. Uh, but someone on Instagram, Artha Demeyu, 
uh, if I'm saying that right, requested that I react to Alip Bata. If you're not familiar with Alip Bata, he's a fingerstyle player that's built a big following on YouTube. Uh, so not strictly a classical guitarist, uh, but I've had requests in the past to do a reaction uh, to Alip Bata, and I haven't done that. So you know what? Let's check out an Alip Bata video, and uh, I'll I'll just uh, react to it and tell you some of my thoughts. So let's see if we can. Uh, Watch a little bit of Elite Bata here for a second. And you know, I think part of the appeal of Elite Bata is he's in this uh, backdrop that shows, you know, he's not like in a a luxurious television studio or you know he doesn't have thousands of dollars uh, put into building a professional looking YouTube backdrop or anything like that uh, you know he's sitting up against what looks like a concrete wall so I think part of the big fan base of Elite Bata is here's this guy that's a really good guitarist uh, playing in what is not a uh, wealthy background and uh, looks like you know uh, maybe coming from uh, from a poorer setting. So I think that may be part of the appeal. Uh, this particular piece that I pulled up, which is I think his most recent uh, video post, is a nice walking bass uh, with kind of a little bluesy melodic uh, passage over it. Some nice finger style playing for sure. <laughs> down there for a second uh, you know nice little interlude I really love his left hand fluency his left hands just very sort of fluid and effortless and so you know I think sometimes as classical guitarists we don't uh, maybe watch some of the finger finger style steel string players as much but I think we can definitely learn some things from somebody like Elite Bata just on the fluency of his left hand uh, the way he plays uh, hammer-ons and pull-offs or slurs so effortlessly I was talking about that in last week's live stream the hammer-on and pull-off technique and and he's really got that down for sure <laughs> Nice, so really fun little palm mute, or in the classical world, we call it pizzicato. Um, so he kind of goes into a nice little pizzicato variation of this little bluesy thing he's doing. Again, the sort of walking bass and the, the little solo over it. So I'll just play a little more and then we'll move on. <laughs> talking about bar chords he had some nice bar chords in there gets around the neck just so fluently with his shifts and uh, tossed in some nice harmonics so yeah Elite Bata very talented guitarist and uh, got a big fan base uh, so thanks for the suggestion uh, from Arthur Demeyu uh, asking me to react uh, to Elite Bata and uh, I also had a message from Andrew Franklin uh, who was indicating that he would like me to do more uh, reaction videos and so I'm certainly open to reacting uh, during the stream and uh, so yeah if you have somebody in particular that you'd like me to be reacting to in the stream you know let me know and I'll, I'll probably do some reactions here in the stream from time to time uh, to other videos uh, in the chat I see voyage says bar chords used to be difficult for me but as time goes by you just realize one day I can actually do a bar chord everyone's fingers a different shape so your bar will be unique to you yeah that's good encouragement voyage so hopefully uh, kaleidoscope hopefully that's encouraging to you uh, with your question about bars because yeah you're right I feel like over time you kind of adjust and tweak and find uh, the right position for you. Uh, I will mention one other tip on bar chords. If you're doing something that's really bar intensive, then sometimes sliding your, um, so sometimes rather just pressing super lightly is a way to practice the bars. You know, if your finger is just so exhausted, um, you know, if you have a passage like, mm -hmm. 
you know, something where it's just all bars, you could practice really without pressing. You know, something like that. And it just gives your left hand a little bit of a break from the fatigue of pressing so hard on the bars. So Kaleidoscope says that is helpful. So great. Uh, glad to hear that. I see Song Pathak says, uh, Paganini Caprice 24, is it really difficult? Uh, that's kind of an easy question. Yes, uh, Paganini Caprice 24 is quite difficult. Uh, certainly, you know, some of the early variations, it's a, it's a theme in variations. So some of the early variations are not as hard, but some of the later ones are very, very hard. Uh, there's some wonderful recordings on YouTube of some really virtuosic players playing that piece. And um, yeah, the, the harder variations are, are very difficult, but it's an awesome piece, uh, you know, when played well. So good question there uh, from Som Pethak. Um, so another question that I had was from Diana May Potts, and she was asking about the Segovia scales. Uh, she just got the Segovia scales book, and she said, I noticed the scales are different for ascending versus descending. Uh, why is that, and how do you apply that? So uh, let me just uh, talk about that for a second. There's actually two different reasons why the Segovia scales are different ascending and descending. So let's take, for example, um, the A minor scale. So if you're playing the A minor scale with the Segovia fingering, it's like this. If you don't miss the shift. It's a little sloppy. Let me uh, do that one more time. there. Um, so anyway, why would it be different ascending versus descending? Well, in this case, in the A uh, minor scale, Segovia is doing melodic minor. So the melodic minor has the raised sixth and seventh notes on the way up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's F sharp and G sharp are the raised sixth and seventh notes in melodic minor. And then on the way back down, it's G natural and F natural, which are the natural minor sixth and seventh notes. So if we just did one octave. So that's one of the reasons why in the minor scales it's different on the way back is we have the natural minor, um, the natural minor sixth and seventh on the way back down, but we have the raised sixth and seventh on the way up. So again, the A minor sounds like this. And so that's really the difference there. Now, then you, you might be like, okay, that explains it, I'm good. But then you get to some of the major scales and Segovia changes the fingering on the major scales coming back down. So like, what about G major? You know, like the G major Segovia fingering goes like this. So that's not the same fingering on the way back down. You know, what's the deal, Segovia? Well, you know, I, I never got a chance to meet Segovia in person, so I never asked him about this, but I am 99% sure the reason he did this is just to get you familiar with different areas on the fingerboard. So in other words, you know, as you're on the way up, you're working kind of these lower positions, um, you know, until you get to the first string, and then there's a big bunch of shifting up the first string. But then on the way back, you know, you're kind of coming back in seventh position, and you're just getting familiar with the middle of the neck. Uh, so I think he's really uh, just, you know, doing it a different way, ascending and descending, to get you more familiar with the neck. So here's G major one more time. How about I do it right? There we go. All right, uh, so good question from Diana May Potts about uh, the Segovia scales. Um, another question that I got in advance was from Ray Blake. Uh, she says she's a short elderly lady, been playing just over a year. Uh, she says, unless I sit on a very low stool with the guitar ending up just under my chin, then I have a problem keeping the guitar securely in place when playing. I tried the Gitano support, but the body still tends to move around and I have to snatch it at mid piece to keep it sliding off my left knee. I also have a luthier built guitar and don't want to really use an attached support. Through trial and error, I find I have to elevate the footstool higher than seems natural in order 
order to get enough slope to hold the guitar close to my body. It has helped, plus I use a micro cloth to create a non-slip surface. Is there a better approach, and could it be I'm putting too much tension on my left hand, so pulling it inwards and conversely allowing guitar body to move away from my body? Thanks. Well, this is a great question. So I'm going to address a few different aspects just of sitting with the guitar because, you know, if we're going to spend uh, an hour or two a day or more uh, playing guitar, it makes sense to do it in a way that is comfortable where we don't feel like the guitar is sliding off her lap and things like this. And by the way, I have a student that I'm working with as a private student who has this same sort of issue that it's just difficult. Uh, to position the guitar. So I'll talk about a few different elements of what uh, Ray has said about this and also um, just kind of what I personally do. So first off, uh, the traditional way is sitting with the footstool. And as she mentioned, you know, definitely if you crank the footstool up really high, it kind of keeps the guitar from sliding forward on your knee. The problem though is cranking the footstool up really high kind of puts pressure on your low, lower back. You know, having that knee way, way up is just not the most comfortable way to sit. And, uh, you know, you do that for a day or two, it's probably okay. But if you do that for weeks and months and hours a day, it may start to really take a toll on your lower back. So I prefer not to have the footstool super high. Um, I used to play most of the time with the footstool, but I have really gotten into where I personally prefer a guitar support. Now, there are several guitar supports that work pretty well. Gatano is not my personal favorite. Um, the one that I use most is called a neck up and it has a sort of rough texture on it, so it's kind of non-slip. So when I use this, um, it does not really slide on my leg. It, it's pretty non-slip. Uh, what I also do, and I don't know where I just kind of set it. Oh, here it is. I also do use a non-slip fabric on my right leg. So between the neck up having non-slip um, sort of texture on my left leg, and then I put this on my right leg, I meant to say. Uh, so between the two, it's pretty stable. Um, in my position. So that's my personal solution. Now, like I said, I have a private student that's kind of in the same situation as this lady. And so two things I've noticed with my private student, one thing is, yeah, sitting on a shorter chair or a shorter bench is really helpful because, yeah, if the, if the seat is too tall for you, then, you know, your knee's going to, your, your, leg is going to be at an angle and the guitar is going to tend to slide off. So you want to find a, a seat where your thigh is parallel to the floor. Uh, and this goes for anybody, you know, if you're super tall or super short or somewhere in between, you want to find a chair where your um, thigh is parallel to the floor uh, when you're just sitting naturally. And once you find a chair that's that right height, then, you know, yeah, you can use the footstool or a guitar support or whatever. The student I have that's had this problem has ended up using a strap. And, you know, some uh, classical guitarists will recoil in horror, how dare you consider the idea of using a strap. And I would say, um, you know what, there is history that straps were used by lute players, by vihuela players, you know, back in the Renaissance period and things like that. So um, it's not, you know, sacrilege for a classical player to use a strap. Um, actually, Brandon Aker over on his channel has a, a very useful video about how to use uh, a strap. And he kind of got into it because he did it with lute and some of the early instruments that he plays. And uh, so I told my student about Brandon Aker's video. He talks about sort of connecting a strap of cloth uh, to the bottom part of the, the uh, strap and putting that slip, strip of cloth under your right leg to help stabilize the strap if you're sitting down. Um, so all that to say, whether you're using a strap or a footstool or a guitar support, there are ways to keep the guitar from sliding. My personal uh, way is, again, I use the neck up guitar support. I use the non-slip fabric on my right leg. I will also say just about sitting position since we're on the topic. I want the neck of the guitar slightly forward. She was talking about pulling the neck back. I don't want to pull the neck back. I want the neck of the guitar slightly forward. I want it about a 45 degree angle here. Um, you know, I want the body of the guitar sloping slightly outward so my right hand can reach over it easily. And I want the guitar, you know, fairly centered on my body, um, you know, so that I have a comfortable access uh, with my left hand up and down the neck and with my right hand across the strings. So hopefully that helps, uh, Ray, with your question. I see Som Pathak says in the chat, if I want to arrange my own songs, what level of knowledge is needed? And after passing, which grade am I able to arrange cool arrangements? Well, that's a great question. And I would say a couple of things. One is you do need a foundation of knowledge, uh, but I think sometimes we wait too long on this. Um, so as far as what grade, 
again, it's a hard question, but I would say even like grade four, let's say, for example, if you're able to accomplish grade four level pieces from Royal Conservatory or Associated Royal Boards of Schools of Music or, you know, like whatever, ABRSM, um, Associated Boards of Royal Schools of Music, you know, any of any of those systems, if you're playing grade four pieces, I would say you could start to create some arrangements. You know, they won't be the most complicated arrangements if it's grade four, but that's okay. They can still sound good. Um, you know, what I found is with composition and arrangement, uh, we sort of get this idea like in order to compose or arrange, you have to be the world's best player before you compose or arrange. And I think, you know, if we compare that to like learning our language, we don't approach it that way. You know, we don't tell kids in the school, hey, until you are able to read a college level biology textbook, you shouldn't try to write a story. You know, we tell our, our young kids in elementary school, hey, go ahead and write a story. You know, tell us about um, an adventure of a, of a bear and a dog or, you know, just, just write a story. And we don't burden our kids with, hey, you know, you've got to be able to read at a college level before you even think about writing. But somehow in the music world, it's like, hey, before you would consider composing or before you would consider arranging, you've got to be at this amazing advanced level of virtuosic skill on the instrument. And I just don't think so. I mean, I think that you can learn to arrange, you can learn to compose. Again, I would say even at a, at a grade four, maybe even before that, because you know you don't wanna put the expectation on yourself, you know, hey, I'm gonna sound like Roland Dienz or Leo Brower or Andrew York, you know, my, my compositions and arrangements are gonna be on the level of those people. No, just, you know, hey, can I take something that is similar in level to the compositions I'm already performing and maybe compose or arrange something of that level that's appropriate for my current skill? I think that's totally possible. So good question. Uh, if you have other questions, do drop them in the chat. I always love to have uh, your questions. Another question I got in advance was from Alpha Centauri. What happens if you don't practice for a month or two? He says, I'm an intermediate or advanced player. Well, if you don't practice for a month or two, you know, your fingers will just start to shrivel up and you won't be able to touch the guitar again. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you do need to keep playing to keep your skill at the same level, but I find if you're an intermediate or advanced player and there's some reason you need to take a month or two off, I mean, it could be you're just burnt out, it could be there's an injury, you have tendonitis or carpal tunnel syndrome or something, or you know, it could be there's some crazy circumstance where you're going on an international trip uh, where you can't uh, bring your guitar with you, or, or what, you know, I don't know what your circumstance is, but if you're in a situation where you're gonna take a month off, uh, then I would say when you come back to it, you'll find you've got a lot of your skill as an intermediate or advanced player. It's very different for a beginner. Beginner takes a month off, man, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna go like 10 steps back. But if an advanced player takes a month off, you'll find that you can probably pretty quickly get back to the level of skill you were, uh, you know, just within a couple of weeks and then, then resume from there. So ideal is to practice uh, every day or, you know, six days a week. Um, five, five, six days a week is the ideal, but certainly it's possible to take a month off and, and come back from it uh, for sure. All right, uh, another question I got in advance was from Angelo Amarim. And he says, uh, thanks for the videos. They're really helping me improve and I'm learning a lot. So always love to hear that uh, good feedback. He says, my question uh, for you today is, I'm an intermediate trying to push to advance, but I never practice scales for practice sake, only approach them when needed for particular pieces and uh, it worked, but I find myself gravitating toward advanced pieces with fast scales. So like Lignani Caprices and Pujola works and I get stuck on the scale segments. I also unfortunately never practice rest stroke and they're really awkward to speed up. I notice classical guitarists can usually do both. Um, it seems like only free stroke when scales get fast. Can you share an opinion on rest and free stroke, rest and free stroke scales and speed? Should I practice both for a well-balanced technique but just master one for speed? Would really enjoy if you could approach this topic. All right, um, excellent question. There's kind of a lot there. Um, so first of all, I do advocate practicing scales separately. I mean, yeah, you can just do scales from the context of a piece and that can be fine. Uh, but I would definitely suggest devoting some time to scales. So whether it's a scale that you take out of a piece and just practice by itself, uh, or if it's like the Segovia scales or something like that. Uh, but, you know, scales really to me have two benefits. One is knowing the fingerboard better. So like saying the letter names, you know, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, that sort of thing, just knowing the fingerboard. 
um, is a benefit of learning scales, but also just the technique and the coordination of the hands is another benefit of uh, learning the scales. And so, um, you know, I think it's just really, you know, a benefit. And, and what you'll see, as, uh, as Angelo, uh, Angelo says, is that you sometimes run into the circumstance where you get to a hard piece and you find you're getting stuck in the scales if you haven't really been devoting some time to them. So I would say devote some time, you know, depends how long you're practicing a day, but if you're practicing a couple hours a day or more, you know, if you're an advanced player, then I would say, you know, spend maybe 20 or 30 minutes on scales. Um, and, you know, if you're practicing less, you know, if you're only practicing 30 minutes a day, maybe you can only spend 10 minutes on scales. But definitely spending some time on scales will really help your overall fluency with the instrument and the coordination of your hands. And, you know, you can do uh, exercises like, um, you know, just starting slow and gradually increasing tempo. So, and then, you know, a little faster, and then a little faster. And I would do that with the metronome so I can gauge my tempo increase. You can also do things like speed burst. Uh, so like a couple slow notes and then some fast notes and then some slow notes. So like. And you know, if you notice like my shift was a little sloppy right there, you might go back and just kind of watch for that shift. You know, and that was better, but if I wanted to really work the shift, I might just work that part. that sort of thing. And so I, I would definitely spend some time with scales and, uh, you know, work them with the metronome, gradually increase the speed, do some speed bursts, work on the challenging parts. You know, sometimes I'll do this sort of uh, evolution of a scale, Scott Tennant calls it, where you do like... You know, that sort of thing where you, basically you kind of add a beat of sixteenths at, at a time and you usually end on a beat. So like one E and a two, one E and a two E and a three, one E and a two E and a three E and a four, one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one, you know, etc. where you're just gradually adding more and more to the scale. And again, just notice like, hey, is the shift throwing me off? Is the synchronization of hands throwing me off? Is the right hand speed uh, quick enough? Is my left hand synchronizing with my right hand? Some of those things. As far as rest and free stroke, I'm a real advocate for trying to get more comfortable with rest stroke. Yeah, my free stroke is most comfortable. So for me, free stroke is faster. But honestly, I know some advanced players where their rest stroke is faster than their free stroke. So it could go either way. Uh, but for me personally, free stroke is faster, but I definitely work on my rest stroke and I try to have my rest stroke very close in speed to my free stroke. So I do work on both of them and I advocate you do the same. You know, the rest stroke really punches the scale out. You know, just helps with the volume and the tone. And so I do advocate, you know, really working on your rest stroke as well as your free stroke. Um, so great question. I see uh, Gene Madsen says, uh, how do you hold yourself back from working on pieces that are too difficult for you? Well, that's a great question. And I guess, you know, if you can find pieces that are your level that you really enjoy, that you really love, then that helps. You know, the draw of the more advanced pieces is not as strong if you really love the pieces you're working on. The problem comes if it's like, hey, these pieces I'm working on are really boring and that super advanced piece just looks so alluring. Uh, that's when it's harder. So I would say try to focus on finding pieces that are your level that you really enjoy and maybe just spend some time, you know, looking through graded anthologies like the Royal Conservatory books, you know, like whatever your grade level is. Um, hey, let me find some uh, pieces that are my level that I really personally like. And then obviously over time, you know, hopefully you continue to advance and get to those more advanced pieces. Uh, I would also say, you know, if you're just really itching to play an advanced piece, is there some part of the advanced piece that you can play? You know, it may be that that advanced piece has, you know, one scale or one passage that's just so ridiculously hard. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe you don't worry about that yet. Uh, maybe you learn a different, easier part of that piece. Or conversely, maybe you do start practicing that super hard piece, but you use it as an exercise and you play it super ridiculously slow. Um, you know, like if you were learning the, the Waltz Opus 8 number four by Barrios, which is in drop D, but you know, there's a scale at the end that's like, And 
And so, you know, if you were wanting to learn that piece, but you know, hey, that scale, it's gonna be hard to get that up to tempo. Maybe you just practice that scale by itself and you practice it very slowly. And then you could just stop there. You don't even have to do the chords because if your focus is just learning the scale, maybe just camp out on that. You know, so either that, or like I said, maybe just find an easy part that you could play. So again, let's say for example, you were wanting to learn this Barrios Waltz Opus 8 number four. Um, it's got this little intro. So maybe you just learn that, you know? And it's like, hey, I have a feeling of accomplishment because I've learned part of Barrios Waltz Opus 8 number four, and you don't have to pressure yourself to learn the whole thing, but you're just like, hey, I was able to learn part of it. So that would be another thought uh, to that question. I uh, see Son Pathak says, after 30 plus years with guitar, what else is remaining for you to discover or learn? Uh, what are your future guitar goals? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, there is so much to learn on the guitar that I feel like I could never learn it all in my lifetime. So I've been privileged to learn a lot about the guitar, but man, there is so much out there. So. Uh, my goals, I would say at this point, are more around giving back. Uh, so, you know, doing videos like these where I can give the knowledge that I've already obtained to others. And so, in other words, I'm not necessarily trying to massively expand my guitar knowledge in new directions. If I were going to, the area that might be a little alluring to me is actually steel string finger style. I really enjoy watching some of the steel string finger style players like Luca Strickignoli and Andy McKee and some of those guys. And so I would love to do more of that. I've played around with some of that. Uh, but I just, because my focus has been classical for so long, I don't spend a ton of time on that. So if I really wanted to push off in a new direction, it'd probably be finger style steel string. But for now, um, I think, you know, my guitar goals are mostly around sharing the knowledge I already have gained over 30 plus years with the classical guitar um, and sharing that with you guys. Uh, I see some Paythex says, is there any time in your guitar journey where you feel you can't go forward or you wanted to quit? How did you overcome? Yeah, absolutely. I've definitely had points in my guitar playing where I got frustrated and wanted to quit. Um, you know, in some cases, it was just kind of a dry spell where I was just discouraged and I didn't feel like my playing was going well. Um, one of the most severe uh, situations was when I was working on my master's degree in guitar performance and I developed severe tendonitis in both arms. And every time I would try to play, I would have these like fiery, fiery shooting pains in my arms. It was just so unpleasant to try to play. And so I began to question, am I going to be able to continue to play the guitar? And I prayed about it a lot. I iced my arms. I did physical therapy. I did everything I could. And after about a year, uh, I was blessed to be able to recover from tendonitis. But uh, that was a situation where I thought, you know what, I'm just going to end up dropping the guitar entirely and having to go in a different direction. Uh, so, um, but I, 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 at those moments, I would re-examine my commitment. You know, is the guitar really something that I believe is important to me? If it is, uh, then I'm going to seek to try to find a way um, to continue to play it. And for me, guitar has just been an important part of my life for a long time. And so I've found ways to continue with it. But even in more recent years, um, I have a leadership role at the university uh, where I teach. And so uh, the leadership responsibilities, working with other faculty, uh, occupies a lot of my time. Uh, so that is a little bit of a challenge for, uh, you know, continuing to expand my uh, guitar knowledge. But I just continue to uh, enjoy the guitar in the way that I have time to enjoy it at this point in my life and give back the knowledge uh, that I've gained uh, to you guys. So uh, thanks for the question there uh, from Som Pathak. Um, I see a question from Gene Madsen that I received in advance. He said, as I look at pieces in the parkening book and the node book, I see differences in notes and fingerings. I'm thinking of how Segovia was a stickler uh, regarding anyone playing his music transcriptions that they should use his exact fingering. How concerned should I be about how I should be playing when I see a particular same piece being played um, differently by other noted classical guitarists? Yeah, so this is a big question and I'll try to be brief, uh, but yeah, you could go in a lot of ways with this question. So good question, Gene. But basically, there are some pieces 
that are written for the guitar by guitarists. Uh, so let's say, for example, pieces by Fernando Sor or Mario Giuliani. Those pieces were written for the guitar by guitarists. So why would anyone have a variance from one performer to another of how they would play a piece that was written by a guitarist for the guitar? Well, um, take for example, Fernando Sor, there are some of his pieces where there are different editions that were published during Sor's lifetime. So one piece that I've played is the Grand Solo, Opus 14 by Sor. And in the Grand Solo, there were actually a couple of different editions, the Castro edition and the Messonnier edition of the Grand Solo that were published during Sor's lifetime, they were drastically different, like whole sections of, you know, 16 measures or more were like left out of one and included in the other and vice versa. And so those two versions are extremely different. And then Dionisio Aguado, whose life kind of overlaps Sor's life, Aguado actually published his own edition of the, the Grand Solo by Sor, Opus 14, and Aguado added these other passages to it, and it's very different. So when you listen to different recordings of the Grand Solo by Sor, you're going to find some who are closer to the Messonnier, some who are closer to the Castro, some who are closer to the Aguado, or some who combine elements of all three. Uh, when I was playing the Grand Solo, I combined mostly the Castro and the Messonnier, didn't use as much from the Aguado. Uh, Manuel Barueco relies heavily on the Aguado edition. So um, that becomes an issue where there's these multiple editions, even of something by a guitar composer written for a guitar. Now, it gets even more complicated if you take a piece like Asturias by Albanese, for example, that was written by piano, I mean written for piano, and then transcribed for guitar. Um, or most of the works of Bach, you know, written for the lute or written for the keyboard or whatever, the violin, uh, the cello, and they're brought over onto the guitar. Man, there's so many different ways you can arrange those pieces for guitar, bass notes you can leave out, bass notes you can add, all these sorts of things. And so it's a lot of judgment calls. So I hope I haven't kind of overwhelmed you um, with all that information, but bottom line, um, you know, it kind of depends on how serious a guitarist you are, I suppose. Um, the short answer is um, do what you like. And the long answer is kind of like that. The long answer is do some research and ultimately do what's supported by your research and do what you like. That's what I would say. Because, um, you know, as long as there's a valid edition out there that supports what you're doing, um, you know, I would say, hey, look, I'm doing the Messonnier edition or I'm doing the Castro, or I'm doing the Guado, or you know, I got mine from the Parkening edition, or the Node book, or whatever. So I think you know, having a reputable source uh, from which you're drawing is good. You know, sometimes you'll go on the internet and you'll find these clearly substandard editions where there's lots of wrong notes and stuff like that. So you know, finding a good edition by a reputable, reputable arranger or reputable um, editor is important, but um, but those variances, yeah, they're gonna be out there. So again, just kind of depends on how serious you are. If you're serious about it, you may wanna do some research and okay, why are there three different versions of this piece and what are the arguments for each? And then, like I said, still, what do I personally like comes into the, um, the scenario. I remember one time uh, I was at a masterclass uh, by David Russell and he was talking about some of these decisions you have to make as a performer and that sometimes we get so like, you know, conflicted because it's like, what would the composer have said? Or, you know, like uh, Gene, you mentioned, you know, what would Segovia have said, you know, about somebody changing something? Well, the thing is, David Russell said, you know what? The composer is not here with us now. Uh, you know, if it's a deceased composer, Segovia is no longer with us, you know, some of those things. So as the performer, we're the one the audience is going to throw tomatoes at if the performance is not good. So David Russell's kind of like, you know, as the performer, I have to own the responsibility of bringing the best performance to the audience. And I have to make the judgment call sometimes. I'm going to go with this edition over that edition or whatever. But, you know, certainly you can get counsel from experienced guitarists on a particular edition. You know, if you have a good teacher you're working with, they can help you uh, with that. And I'm happy to answer specific questions on certain pieces or, you know, do some research and get back to you if I don't know uh, the answer. Uh, so good question there. I see Dr. Roland Freisler says, can you talk about thumb placement, please? Uh, well, I'm curious if you mean right hand thumb placement or left hand thumb placement, but I guess I can talk briefly about both. Um, and if you want to clarify in the chat uh, whether you're talking about right hand or left hand, but with the right hand, I typically have the thumb placed kind of out to 
uh, one side of the fingers so that you know it's not getting up under the fingers the the tip is gonna come down and and sort of touch the outside of the index finger so when I do a thumb stroke I stay on the outside of index so I want to have the tip of my right hand thumb out kind of to the left of, of the hand as far as the yeah, okay so you are talking about the right hand well I'll stay on that for another moment then uh, so I have the tip out there um, you know a bit to the left and I also um, am arranging it so that the thumbnail is roughly parallel with the string. And the reason I do that is it avoids scraping. You know, if I turn the, uh, the thumb where it's kind of at an angle to the string, you get this scraping sound. So I want the thumbnail to be roughly parallel to the string so I don't get any scraping when the nail sort of slides through uh, the string. Uh, so that's kind of how I think about that thumb positioning. And I want the thumb stroke to be as efficient as possible. I don't want a lot of extra movement where the thumb goes way up in the air. I want the thumb to just kind of efficiently move down to the side of the index finger and then back to the string. Um, so I think of it as kind of like a little, almost like pendulum swing where the thumb goes down like this. The returning pendulum swings a little higher so you don't hit the string on the way back. And then you pluck the string and then your thumb comes back, uh, something like that. So if you have any follow-ups on that, on the right hand thumb, I'm happy to talk about that. You know, sometimes people ask me about the left hand thumb, so I'll touch on that as well. I just want that to be roughly behind my left hand middle finger, supporting the pressure on the neck. Um, so wherever my middle finger is along the neck, that's roughly where it is. Uh, depending on you know whether I'm more toward the sixth string or first string, I kind of slide my hand back and forth. So if I'm on the sixth string, I want the tip of the thumb more under the sixth string. If I'm on the first string, I want the tip of the thumb uh, more under the first string. So that's a little bonus. I know his question's about right hand thumb, but that's a little about left hand thumb. So if you have any follow-ups, let me know. I see Gene Madsen says, thanks. I know that was a loaded question. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, classical guitarists sometimes uh, feel like half the fun is arguing. And um, what unfortunately happens sometimes is um, classical guitarists start putting each other down. You know, oh, I can't believe you would use that edition. You know, the XYZ edition is horrible. No, no scholar of the guitar would use the XYZ edition. I'm not super into that, you know, to, to putting others down. I definitely have my opinions about editions that are better than others, and I'm not afraid to share my opinions. I'm not afraid to say, hey, this is why I like this particular edition better than another one. Um, but, you know, I, I don't see any need to kind of bash somebody or say, hey, you're wrong because how would you dare use such an edition? But uh, anyway, so it was a fun one. Uh, so Pathak says, can you talk about guitar considered as an orchestra? Is it possible to arrange a symphony on guitar? So that's a great question. And the whole idea of guitar as an orchestra, this was a quote that was made famous by Segovia, but others have said it as well. And, you know, the idea is that you can get all these different tone colors out of the guitar. So, you know, you can get a very bright tone. You can get a sort of normal tone. You can get a very dark tone. You know, you can get harmonics. You can get palm mute. Um, you know, there's, there's just all these different uh, variants of the tone you can get. You can get, you know, hammer-ons and pull-offs. You can get slides. You can even pluck behind the nut, nut as a special effect. Uh, you can drum on the guitar. Um, so there's just, you can do tambora. So there's so many different sounds you can get from a guitar that the comparison has been made, again, by Segovia and others, that this is like a miniature orchestra. You know, you've got your flutes and your violins and your trumpets and your uh, percussion and all the different orchestral instruments all available to you as far as these different uh, varieties of tone you can get out of the guitar. Uh, so I think that is a wonderful aspect of the guitar, um, just that, that orchestra of sound possibilities that we have. Um, as far as can you arrange a piece that's written for a symphony uh, onto the guitar, you can. You're going to have to reduce it a lot, and it's still going to be pretty hard. Um, so, you know, an example of somebody who's done this a lot is Kazuhito Yamashita, the uh, Japanese guitarist. Uh, he's done, for example, the New World Symphony by Dvorak. And if you look that up on YouTube, uh, New World Symphony by Dvorak, played by Kazuhito Yamashita, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty intense. But, um, and he does the uh, Mazursky pictures at an exhibition, originally an orchestral piece, also arranged for the guitar. So, um, 
and I guess Firebird by Stravinsky, I think Yamashita does as well. So it's definitely possible to do symphony pieces on the guitar, uh, but unless you're a crazy virtuoso like Yamashita, you end up having to reduce them. But you know, maybe some of the simple themes, uh, like thinking of that New World Symphony, it's got a really um, sort of slow movement that's very lyrical, and I've seen some very um, attainable, like you know, grade four level arrangements of this of the slow movement. So uh, it's possible that some aspects of symphonies, especially you know, slower passages, may be uh, more you know. Uh, playable at a at a grade four or grade five level as opposed to this virtuosic level like Yamashita or um, Jorge Caballero is another guy that's done some of the same sorts of pieces that Yamashita has done just crazy virtuosic. Um, I see uh, Dr. Roland Freisler says awesome thank you maestro absolutely glad to help out for sure. Uh, Box and Peppers that's a cool username. What are some strategies for playing more legato? I have difficulty with playing smoothly and evenly. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a good question. So the term legato, you know, uh, a lot of times it's used to describe hammer-ons and pull-offs. And I talked a lot last week about hammer-ons and pull-offs. So if you have more questions about hammer-ons and pull-offs or slurs, as they're also called, we can talk about that again this week. But uh, as far as legato, the, the term is used to describe just connecting two notes uh, without a break in sound. So legato in that instance is the opposite of staccato. So staccato is a break in notes. And then legato is this connection where you try as little break as possible. And so if you're trying to have as little break in sound as possible, I mean, certainly you could do hammer-ons and pull-offs, which, like I said, are sometimes referred to as legato. But if you're plucking, you just need to synchronize the two hands. So really, there's three things that stop legato when you're plucking notes. One is if you touch the string too soon with your right hand, so like this. And so that stops the legato. A second thing is touching the string too soon with your left hand. And uh, so that uh, is another one that will stop the legato. So you want to avoid that. And then taking a left hand finger off too soon. So like that also interrupts the legato. So what you're ultimately seeking to do is really synchronize the hands where the right hand's not ahead of the left hand, left hand's not ahead of the right hand. They're both moving at exactly the same time to have you know, no break in sound. So hopefully that helps as far as how to create more legato. If you have any follow-ups, let me know. I see Ray Blake says, hi, Sean, just caught up with you a bit late, but I'll get the full video later. Yeah, Ray, actually, I talked about your sitting position topic a little earlier in the stream. Uh, so, yeah, if you missed it, you know, maybe you can go back and watch the replay. But I did I did talk a good bit about your your sitting position topic. So thank you for that. Uh, so Paypex says, Segovia said flamenco guitarists are noise. Uh, what is your opinion? Well, you know, Segovia had a habit of uh, putting down people and categories of people he didn't like. You know, he said about piano. Uh, piano is a monster and it uh, howls when you touch its teeth or something like that. And so, you know, he's putting down the piano. He's putting down flamenco guitarists. Um, I guess I'm just not really interested in putting people down. I think the piano is a beautiful instrument. I think flamenco guitar is just a lot of fun to listen to. Um, I personally like classical guitar better than flamenco. I personally like guitar better than piano. Uh, but I don't feel like we need to, you know, put down flamenco guitar or put down the piano just because we like classical guitar. Um, so I guess I differ in uh, that from Segovia. Obviously, I can't uh, claim to be the amazing uh, virtuoso and influence on the guitar that Segovia was. So it may seem a little presumptuous of me to offer my opinion on this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I like flamenco guitar. I think it's a lot of fun. I play around, you know, with some of the flamenco techniques, the, you know, Raschiato, for example. <laughs> Just think that kind of thing is a lot of fun. Um, you know, the true flamenco guitarists are improvising within a set um, sort of rhythmic pattern. Um, you know, they have the the compass and the you know the structure of uh, of each different type. You know, whether it's a solea or a guajiras or you know whatever the form is, there's a particular sort of beat pattern. Uh, you know, almost like a 12-bar blues that we're used to in America. Uh, they have kind of that set uh, compass or that set form. 
uh, that they use uh, for um, you know their improvisation in flamenco. So I've I've played around a little bit with some of the flamenco uh, improvisation and forms. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm more of a classical player, but but I think flamenco is a lot of fun. Uh, Ray Blake says, thank you. The higher foot position still seems to be working. Thank goodness. Be interesting to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, my only concern about the high foot position is the strain it may put on your back over time. And so again, if you go back and watch the earlier part of the stream in the replay, uh, you'll be able to see what I said about that. Uh, so a uh, good one there. Um, let's see, another uh, question that I had in advance was from David English, uh, who said, lately I've been looking for ways to make scale and arpeggio practice interesting and uh, use it for improvisation. I'm doing it by playing different scale shapes on different root notes. I'm sure there's other ways. So yeah, as far as making scale and arpeggio practice interesting, yeah, I think playing different patterns on different root notes is a, a good way to make it more interesting. Um, and then I think, you know, you can also do things like speed bursts and some things which I talked about earlier in the stream that will help as well. Uh, but so let's just take, for example, the C major scale. Let's say I'm wanting to play the C major scale and make it more interesting. So I might just, you know, start with the Segovia C major, for example. But I might also, um, you know, think like what other shapes could I play with C major? Well, there's the whole idea of the cage shape. So I could do a C scale right here. I could do the C scale right here. I could do the C scale right here. I could do the C scale here. I could do the C scale here. You know, so finding the different places on the neck uh, where you can play the scale and, you know, the sort of caged format, C-A-G-E-D, the caged format is, you know, finding five different places up the neck to play the scale. That can be helpful. Um, same with arpeggios. You know, you can play an arpeggio in different positions. So definitely finding different places to play the scales can help um, you know, with variety uh, and different places to play arpeggios can create variety. Uh, you mentioned improvisation, David, and yeah, I think improvising can be fun. Uh, you can find on YouTube or other places backing tracks. Um, so you know, let's say in the key of C major, you might have a backing track that's doing something like. You know, just like a C major and a G and an A minor and an F chord, you know, which is one of these super common progressions in popular music. And then you could just play around with your C major, you know, just play around with the notes in C major over that chord progression in the key. Um, and I see some faith that says uh, C major is all white keys on piano. So good to remember all whites in guitar. Yeah, so obviously we don't have the white key, black key distinction on the neck of the guitar, but yeah, the C major is all natural notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Um, so that's helpful there. I would say also, you know, technically speaking, um, you know, you can make scale practice more interesting with things like the speed burst that I mentioned earlier. So. You know, so that's sort of a technique way to make it interesting. Um, and also doing the evolution of a scale from Scott Tennant where you're like. Or, you know, that sort of thing where you're gradually adding beats of the scale uh, that can make it more interesting. And just working it with the metronome. Uh, I remember talking to a guy years ago um, who used to practice scales for a couple hours a day. And I was like, how do, how do you stay interested in practicing scales for two hours a day? And he said, well, I think of it like an Olympic sport. He's like, you know, the Olympic athletes are always trying to shave that second off their time on their 100 meter dash or whatever, um, you know, or even a fraction of a second off their time of the 100 meter dash. And so he said, for me, I'm always trying to get that scale just a little faster. So maybe I got the C major scale to quarter equals 120 playing 16th notes. Could I get it to 124 on the metronome? Could I get it to 126 on the metronome? Just always trying to push the envelope with the technique. That's another way to keep it interesting. And after this guy, Steve, told me this, I was like, man, that's a good point. I started playing that way and I, I found it would hold my attention. I'm like, man, I'm trying to get two more beats per minute on the metronome. And I would just sit there for an hour trying to get it just two more beats per minute faster. And so that's another way to make it interesting along with you know the different patterns, along with doing the improvisation. So good question there from David. I see some Pathak says, thanks for all your answers. Your stream always good to see and I gain new insights. So great, uh, glad the stream is helpful for you. 
Um, I had one specific to my channel from RNT who said, how did you come up with your channel name, Smart Classical Guitar? So that's an interesting question. Uh, so, you know, years ago, so I actually started this channel uh, about six years ago. And uh, when I first started it, I was differentiating it. At the time, I had another channel called Sean Beaver's Guitar, which is my name. I've since taken the Sean Beaver's Guitar channel down. But the idea was Sean Beaver's Guitar was, was, was going to be where I'd post performance videos. And then Smart Classical Guitar was where I was going to post more instructional videos. Where, well, over time, Smart Classical Guitar has become more and more my main channel to the point where I just took the other channel down. And so I post kind of a mix. But my vision for Smart Classical Guitar is this channel is about the guitar and it's about you as the audience and what is helpful to you. So that's different than some other channels. You know, some channels, it's about the person. Um, you know, hey, I'm the virtuoso and I'm going to play. And that's great. You know, I love to go on channels uh, and listen to virtuosos play, but I didn't want this channel to be about, hey, let me try to play the most difficult and most obscure piece that I can possibly play. I wanted this channel to be about, hey, let me play etudes and, you know, grade four and five level pieces. And let me do instructional content like this live stream where I can help out the listeners. So the idea of smart classical guitar is, hey, you know, if you want to be smart about learning the classical guitar by getting good information that's going to help you to make progress faster, this channel is going to be one where you can come and you can get helpful information that is, again, focused around the guitar, focused around you, the viewer, not so focused around me as the personality, like, oh, how amazing is Sean Beavers? No, the focus is the guitar, the focus is you as the viewer. So, um, you know, for now, Smart Classical Guitar is the name. I have toyed around with changing it at times, uh, but uh, that's kind of how I came up with the name. So RNT, thank you for that question. And um, then another question I got in advance was from Rob Massey, and he was, uh, he was asking, uh, what's your routine for learning a new piece? And in my experience, it can be a bit of a problem spending too much time on it, but letting the existing ones slide back. And uh, yeah, that can be a challenge. So what I would say is, you know, let's, it depends how much time you're spending, Rob, on learning a new piece. But let's say, for example, that you were spending an hour a day. Um, so if you're spending an hour a day, I would advise maybe spending 15 minutes or so on like scales and arpeggios and, you know, technique and stuff like that. Uh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes on that. Then 20 minutes on a focus piece of the day. And then the remaining 20 pieces, I mean, 20 minutes on pieces that you already play well. So that last 20 minutes is helping you keep from sliding back. And it's also, um, you know, just kind of a reward to play through pieces you already play well is fun. Uh, but that middle 20 minutes, that's where I'd really dive into the new piece. And so, you know, if you're playing an hour every day, that middle section is like, hey, let's really dive in, uh, spend 20 minutes, uh, make some real progress on the new piece. And then that last 20 minutes then is, um, you know, just fun, just play through stuff you enjoy. And depending how much time you spend practicing, just adjust accordingly. So if you were spending two hours a day playing, then maybe your first 30 minutes is technique and scales and arpeggios and slurs and stuff. And then... Uh, your next maybe 45 minutes or an hour is just focused in on your new piece. And then the last 30 minutes or so is playing through existing repertoire. So hopefully that helps. Well, I appreciate you guys as always tuning in for the stream. And uh, I do these each Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. So I hope you will join me next week. Keep making music. Have a great week and I'll see you in the next one.